We are continuing with our teacher training at Howard University. Our next presenter is Lisa Harmon, who was born in Cairo, Egypt. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm Lisa, and I'm going to be presenting on Egypt. Um, if there's anything that you feel I should add, or your different age groups or anything, you should ask me. Um, so Egypt, also must. That's how you what you call it, and it's the name of Egypt in Arabic. It's a a meme, a sod, and a re. Our alphabet is right to left. <coughs> it's pronounced a must. 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 Yeah, no a. Yeah. Okay. M a s r. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so Egypt is all the way in that top northeastern corner of Africa, um, but it has a little peninsula, and the Red Sea goes in between it, and that's sort of considered Asia, but nobody. You know, no Egyptian says, oh, I'm half Asian. Um, and it's bordered by Sudan and Libya, and also by the Red Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Gaza Strip in Israel, which is on the other side of the peninsula. So it's, you know, sort of far away. Um, Cairo is the capital city and the most populated by far, um, followed by Alexandria. Uh, one thing to note is that even though Egypt looks like there's enough space for all the millions of people that live there, it's very, the population is really concentrated up and down the Nile. So like Cairo and Alexandria are along the Nile, which makes sense because, you know, from the beginning of time, people were stayed, you know, to very fertile land so they could live like that. Um, Egypt is a lot closer to, you know, the rest of the Middle East and Europe and Asia and the rest of Africa, so there's like a lot of tourism. Um, and it's a really international population because of that. You know, it's really accessible, except for right now because of the revolution. No one's going there. <laughs> you guys should go because tickets are cheap. Um, <laughs> so there's 82 million people. Um, it has one of the largest populations in Africa and the Middle East. Like I said, it's really dense. So that picture is, of course, during the revolution. But really, on a daily basis, that's what the city looks like. I mean, there's people everywhere. And it's the city that never sleeps. Um, so they go up and down, you know, the populations are along the Nile. Um, the majority of people are Egyptian, followed by a substantial number of foreigners, American, European, Asian, Canadian. Um, that's, that's pretty much The Egyptians, almost every other Egyptian speaks English, you know, and they speak Spanish and French, and because they're you know, really good at learning, that's something that Egyptians are known for, and they're really easy for tourists to come and visit because it's very easy to communicate with people what you want and what you're looking for and it used to be very very safe um, so there's like you know a million city you know millions of people living in the city it's very crowded um, and it's like a 24-hour city everything is open all the time everything delivers all the time and there's lots of public transportation I would say it's like a third world New York very much I mean it's just really very much like that except that it's dirtier and less fancy and less, <laughs> there's obviously a lot less money. Um, and then there are the Bedouins, so that, that bottom right picture. And these people are nomads still, they still live a very, they, they're living the same life that their great, 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 great grandparents were living. They travel, they still do a lot of trade. Um, they tend to stay a little bit closer to the coast now, um, I'm not really sure why that is. You can actually take tours with them. You, know, you can go for like a week and they'll take you through the desert. It's very fun and interesting. And um, then there's like, there's some people living in these villages and they're very small, they're conservative. More and more people are leaving to the big cities to make money. Um, Egypt is, you know, has been losing money for a long time there. It's always been a you know a poor nation, and now it's getting more and more poor. So people can't really afford to the middle class can't afford to live there anymore. You know, so people are being forced out of. There's nothing in, in these villages anymore. They're being forced into the city, making the city more crowded, and um, which is you know t too bad. We're losing a little bit of history, I think there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the African influence on the Egyptian people, Upper Egypt, which is actually like the second, the bottom half of the country along the Nile. That's Upper Egypt, and I think because the Nile like flows the other way when you're just looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was like, before it was Egypt, it was, they called it Nubia, and that was when the people from Sudan and 
other countries, other African countries from the south were sort of in that area. It was before there were lines and Africans lived here and Egyptians, you know, it wasn't like, so I was like that. So um, I would, I think that more than an influence, there's been a fusion of African and Egyptian culture. So it's not like one had a really strong influence over the other, but over the centuries of, um, you know, from the time of the pharaohs when there was this hierarchy, I mean, there's just, it's been this huge, very much like the United States. Um, so like their food is very similar and because the um, climates are very similar, they're eating the same food, I mean, they're like working the same land, so that it's really much more of a fusion there's, than an influence. One didn't take over more than the other. Um, you can tell in when you're in Egypt, very dark-skinned Egyptians, they typically come from Nubia. That's my mom. <laughs> She is from, um, her family's from Upper Egypt. I couldn't find a better picture, and I just thought that that would be. Um, so, like, she is Nubian, and I don't know if this is, like, something you want to talk about with your students, but, like, she was always teased, teased a little bit. A lot of her friends were light-skinned, and she was always a little bit, you know, in Egypt they have these creams, to, you know, to lighten your skin. So, it's a, it's... I, sort of similar to here. I mean, there's still a lot of mm -hmm. racial issues. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. So, and, you know, my mom is a strong, independent woman, and she still feels sort of like, and when she, she they live in my parents' community, but when she comes here, she feels a little bit self-conscious, so. Um, and also, I didn't include this, but, you know, with everything going on in Sudan, Egypt recently, like in the last 10 years, offered to take in a bunch of refugees. And Egypt did nothing. I mean, th there was no place for them. It wasn't taken care of properly. So these refugees came in, and we have like instead of we don't have a lot of traffic lights, we have the circles, these roundabouts, and that's how our traffic is. It's not good. And so these <laughs> refugees were put in these roundabouts, and that's just like I mean, the roundabouts are nothing special. They're just grass, and you know where all these cars are going. So these refugees came, and they're taking all the jobs that Egyptians would never take. It. You know, it's just like. So there's, there's still, there's tension there because Egyptians feel like they're losing their jobs and, and so I didn't include that because like I didn't include religion, those are things I didn't know if it was like appropriate for you guys wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. But I'd be happy to talk about it more, like send you more information if you like. Um, so as far as influence, it's much more of a fusion for like this, mm -hmm. for the purposes of the camp okay. and that, that has worked really well. Um, okay, Egyptian, the official language is Arabic. There are two kinds, colloquial and modern standard. Um, colloquial is just like the Egyptian Arabic we speak every day, but modern standard is what we, what I, like, that was the Arabic that I was taught in school. So it's very formal, and it's the Arabic that is spoken across the Middle East. So if someone comes to Egypt and they speak modern standard Arabic, they'll be understood, but of course the Egyptians will be like, oh, I wonder, they think they're so snooty, you know, coming to our country. And, because Egyptian Arabic is the most beautiful Arabic, I think. Um, they're loud, Egyptians are spicy, like their food, um, and they're incredibly, they're, they're friendly, so they're a nice, it's a, it's a, they're a nice people, they want to help you, sometimes too much, and it's like, it's okay, I'll get my own cab, you know, or like, whatever, or like, I'll pick out my own oranges at the store, you know, they're very, they're eager, they want to, um, and they're really community-based, it's a kind of culture, they, they live with their whole families forever, and then when their kids are old enough to, to live in their own place, they don't live, move to another apartment, they move like to the apartment above you, you know, or to like the suite next door or something, you know, so that it's very, it's very, very close. Um, there's a really small upper class, and the upper class is so rich, and they have so much money, it's old money, a lot of it's like from the government, they're now gone because of the revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's like a pretty big gap to the middle class. The middle class used to be our strongest class, mm -hmm. but that's changing. Things are getting so expensive, and now the middle class is struggling now, mm -hmm. which is terrible. But this is the whole reason this whole revolution is happening. And then a huge lower class, and the lower class is very poor. And the gap between the lower and the middle class is like probably unlike any other gap. I, well, I'm sure a lot of, you know, other, I'm sure it's like that in a lot of third world countries, but in Egypt it's very bad. I mean, the poor have not, literally nothing. The middle class is starting to fall into that, which is really too bad. Um, 
Soccer is a favorite pastime. Our national team has won the African Cup numerous times, which is exciting. Um, unfortunately, now it's creating there's a stigma because the, there's have been some big games during the revolution, and you know people are they're starting these big fights at these soccer games, and people are dying, and it's just it's just a mess. But it, otherwise, it's a it's a very fine. Kids are playing all the time, and oh, you know, and this is probably a, a huge African influence. Mm -hmm. Um, most of the Egyptian players are, like, they're probably Nubian, you know, you can tell they sort of come from a family where I'm sure it's been played mm -hmm. for a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, Egypt has a really tough, the ancient Egypt is, has a pretty tough history. Um, they were really excelling in a lot of inventions and innovations and things that we still use today. And they were you know, the pharaohs were living in a, a really a beautiful fairy tale time. I mean, there was gold, there were temples, but those didn't like come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. So ancient Egypt, I mean, does come from a culture of slavery. And this was of the Jews, of Africans, um, who built these things. So it's sort of a tough, like in any public school in Egypt, they won't teach that. They will only teach the big successes. Um, mm -hmm. Egypt is very regulated. You know, we could have, Prince of Egypt never came out, you know, things like that. So it's still it's very, a little bit sort of controlled. Um, so toothpaste, algebra, makeup, brushes, things like this that we use every day, which is really cool. So that's interesting. Um, but the, you know, all the violence and stuff, um, and it was very extravagant. There's tons of gold everywhere, and it was very similar to today. I mean, that you were a pharaoh and you were super rich, or you were like a village person and you didn't have much, or you were a slave and you were working for these pharaohs. Okay, we know all this because they were really good at preserving everything. So the people that, you know, the pharaohs and these people that were in the higher class, they were, you know, their bodies were preserved and they were put in these huge tombs with like things that they would need for the afterlife. So like cups and plates and clothing and it was so well preserved in these, in these tombs, really deep down in the bottom of pyramids. Mm -hmm. So we were able to find a lot of evidence about their way of life. Um, They also built these, the, the pyramids, which are still a great feat today because they would have been hard to hard to build with the technology we have now, let alone what they were using then. And what they were using then was manpower. So that was just human beings building these huge things, and they're really big. Um, they're closed now. You can't go in anymore. The last time I was went in one, I was probably eight or nine, so 15 years ago. Um, during the revolution in 2011, the museums were ransacked. There's not a lot left, but you know the rest of the world has plenty. There's like stuff in London, and the rest of the world has, yeah. But we don't have much anymore, unfortunately. I mean, the, these people are so desperate that this means really nothing to them. You know, they're just working so hard to create a better future, and so you know, terrible things happen. People are pushed to desperation. These were their homes. They lived in these huge temples, like almost carved right out of rock. And they were painted really lavishly. And um, there are, you can still go to them today. The paint is very faded. You really can hardly see it. But um, there are lots of projects to preserve a lot of this stuff. Um, USAID, United States Agency for International Development, works really hard on lowering the water levels, because that salt water is um, decaying the stuff. That's, that's my dad's project. That's what he does there. Oh, he used to. Um, so it's very interesting and cool. So um, it's still there, but you know, tourism is dead now. So no one's going to these places, which is too bad, because now we have even less money than we did when we started. Um, so after you know the ancient pharaohs died out, and you know, the more modern history. We were under the control of a lot of different countries. We we're all, you know, a colony. So there's definitely that mindset still, um, similar to like South Africa or other countries that were under control for so long. Um, we just became independent, so that's really, ex you know, it's still new. Um, it's democratic, but the elections are, I don't think, very fair, <laughs> you know. it's. A country that still has, has a long way to go, even before this revolution. 
Um, in 2011, President Mubarak was overthrown. He had been the president for 30 years. And while he was not like a religious dictator, he just, I think, stopped caring that much. Um, it's not how he started, it's just really sad. So he was overthrown and this new president was fairly elected, I use the term loosely. Um, he is a, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. I didn't know how much I should talk. I mean, for the purpose of this presentation, you can talk about it, um, and we filter those things through okay. to make sure that only, a, you know, the appropriate information right. is taught, uh, okay. discussed with our campers, so it's okay. Um, well, he is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, so um, a lot of Muslim, Egypt, Egypt is like 99% Muslim, a very, very small percent is, is Christian, Coptic Christian, or Orthodox Christian, you know, Greek Orthodox um, so a, a lot of people voted for him, and all the people that didn't vote for him haven't changed their minds, and all the people that have voted for him have totally changed their minds because he is, his platform was that he's not, he, will not become, he will not impose Islam on the whole entire country. These are his values, but he just wants to like, help the actual problems, which are there's no money. Kids that are coming out of are paying so much money for colleges in Egypt, and they're not good. They're not getting any jobs. Um, it's too expensive to live, it's getting dirty and more violent, and so these, this is what the revolution came from, and he promised to take care of all of that. He has done nothing. All he wants to do is take away the rights of women. So this is very bad, because Egypt is, is not like that. We are very cosmopolitan, it is not like Saudi Arabia. I mean, you can wear, I can wear t-shirts, I can wear things to my knees, um, and now like we can't, my, we can't. My mother now, she has to wear long sleeve and jeans all the time. Um, so this is, it's going, it's going completely backwards. This isn't the direction that anyone wants it to go in. Um, but because it's the kind of country that doesn't have the checks and balances, it's not like, so he's getting away with a lot, unfortunately. Um, so it's getting worse, it's getting more violent. And now there is zero money funneling in from tourism. No one is going there, <laughs> rightly so, I guess so. Now we're losing even the tiny amount of money we were getting before. So it's, it's problematic. This is, this is the part of the Arab Spring and this happening all over the Middle East. I always hoped that Egypt, I always thought, oh, well, Egypt will never be like Syria, but, you know, maybe it's heading in a, in a sort of bad direction. Mm -hmm. um, the police here on the left, I mean, they're everywhere. They're barricading, they're shooting, they're using tear gas and it's the civilians. It's becoming crazy. Like, this is crazy. This is not where I, you know, this is not the Egypt I remember. Um, so it's a desert, it's always really hot. In the desert itself, it gets freezing at night if you go camping there or something. Um, but it's always warm, it gets up to like, you know, in the winter it gets down to maybe the 50s-ish. I was just there in December, it was not very cold at all. Um, cities and villages are up and down the Nile, it's a third world country, so the money is, you know, very low. Um, their food is really good. It's mostly rice and the livestock that they um, that they can tend to. So a lot, lots and lots of chicken, um, some lamb, grape leaves is very popular, and I think that must be from the you know sort of Greek influences. Ours are a little bit different. Um, lots of fish. The seafood there is so good, obviously because of the Nile. The Nile is a, you know a big source of food um, and really life. Um, pita bread is called belity bread. And it's like the people's bread. That's what they eat every day. This is government subsidized, and um, this is the, the basis for any diet. And you find it on the streets. People are just making them on the fire right there on the streets. It's very good. Um, the public school system is bad. It's nothing like here. So Egyptians are, you know, a lot of Egyptians are forced to send their kids to private schools, which are not much, well, they are substantially better, but for a huge, huge price. And that's too bad because it's the same with the colleges. Colleges, the private, the public colleges are not good at all, but the private ones are so so expensive. And regardless of which one you go to, you'll come out of college and you will not find a job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's primarily Muslim, followed by Christian. Um, because it's a Muslim country, it's a much more conservative in dress. Um, Arabic is left to right, and. Um, it has very, very beautiful beaches. That's something that it was always known for, which you might not think of right away because it has these pyramids and this other rich history, but its beaches are, are beautiful. And um, a few things I left out that I just made note of um, yesterday or in the last few days. 
Um, you can sort of see like the art here. I mean, the art comes from from ancient Egypt and contemporary art. And this is similar with uh, music, ancient art and ancient music. This is, it's like a dying art. Nobody listens to it anymore. You know, like my parents and and the older generations they do. Contemporary art and music is totally influenced by the West, and it's not very good <laughs> compared to what you know used to come out of Egypt. Um, indigenous animals, really the only thing that can survive there is the camel, because it's so hot. And camels are still used as a form of transportation, as a form of, you know, they're still eaten, and um, they're a form of, you know, they're used to carry things across the desert, but they're all over the city too. People take them into the city to bring their wares, and, um, I guess a notable person is an author named Nagim Mahfouz. He was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, he writes very, he writes about the old middle class, old Egypt, living in the city and, and, um, and it was a different time back then, you know, the, the working class and the jobs that they had, and that's what he writes about. And he writes about the struggles of the middle class coming out of this colonial history, and um, he writes everything in Arabic, and it's translated to English, so I think that's sort of interesting because of the way you know it gets translated. It's, you can't exactly translate it. Um, Do you have the spelling of his name? Yeah. yeah. N-A-G-U-I-B, um, M-A-H-F-O-U-Z. Thank you. I actually I have some of his books, and I could go through some storage to find some traditional dress. I'd be happy to bring it back sometime, mm -hmm. or we could be in touch. I could bring yes, it. we um, would like to have that available. For okay, him, if that's okay. Yeah, I'm so, I, I'm that. sorry that I wasn't more organized, but I will keep in touch with you, and I'd be happy to bring anything back that you'd like. Okay. Um, okay. Traditional dress is contemporary, you know, uh, very similar to what we wear here, except that traditional <laughs> men in the working class and the lower classes they wear. Galabeas, which is a big dress, and they wear those because it's so hot, <laughs> and with those you can have. Um, men don't usually wear shorts, so that's sort of a, you know, you can tell that, that that's a much more foreign thing. Um, and of course, Muslims, all, most Muslims are, they veil. Um, in the last five or six years, I would say there's much more veiling than there was before, so there, it's definitely it's coming around again. Um, if you don't fail, it's not a big deal. I, you know, my mom is, we don't fail. Um, it's my, it's starting to get a little more dangerous. You know, I think some women are starting to feel nervous because they look not Muslim because they are not veiled. So they maybe feel like a little bit more of a target, but otherwise, um, okay. Anyone have any questions? The Bedouin, am I saying this right, the Bedouins? Mm -hmm. Do you know where that name came from? You said? No. I, I don't. Mm -hmm. I've always assumed that it was just a word that mm -hmm. came, you know. Um, but I'd be happy to. I don't know if it was like a region or something. Mm -hmm. I'll make a note of it and I'll look okay. Are the women allowed to drive? <coughs> yes. Women are allowed to drive. Women are not good. Nobody is a good driver in Egypt, but um, women are allowed to drive. There are no driving schools, nothing. My mom, for her 16th birthday, her dad bought her a license. She is not a good driver. She says otherwise, and that's not true. Um, yeah. And the cars are old. The traffic is not good. So they have the same rights as um, Unfortunately, not so much. For instance, well, they do. If, if a woman, there's something like if a woman gets a divorce, then she doesn't get to take anything, like, because if it's her decision, then she doesn't get the kids, she doesn't get a house, any money. So there are definitely, the, the women, women are, are so I'm sorry, it's getting worse now. Um, the new president is calling for zero rights. So that would be a, a problem because, like, you know, women can live alone, you know, in Egypt. They can own property, they can do it, you know, they can go out whenever they want. It's, I'm sure, a little bit scorned on, you know, if there's like a young Egyptian woman who went to college, got a job, got an apartment. People probably think that's very strange, like why wouldn't she get married, why wouldn't she be having children, but it's totally, it's allowed. Um, they're just not allowed to show anything. Just Eva? 
Is there an easy food that we can show them how to make that would be considered traditional or something like that? Yeah, it's um, a meal called koshari, K-O-S-H-A-R-Y, and it is very cheap to make, it's very easy to make, so that's why it's a very popular food there. It is rice, and then those very thin like spaghetti noodles broken up, mm -hmm. and chickpeas, those are the white, mm -hmm. they're kind of big, okay, mm -hmm. chickpeas. Chickpeas are yellow. Yellow, yellow, I, they're more like that, and um, let's see, the rice, the noodles, the chickpeas, lentils, black, small black lentils, tomato sauce, just any thin, very thin, nothing in the tomato sauce, no other vegetables or anything like that, just the tomato sauce, and then um, fried sliced onions, all in one, and it's very good. What is that called again? Koshari, it's K-O-S-H-A-R-Y. And it is really, really good. And you can make a lot of it. You know, you can make a huge thing of rice, a huge thing of chickpeas, the lentils, the pasta, the... And just mix it all together. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there a certain spice or something that we have to put in it to make it? The tomato sauce is a little spicy. Maybe it's cumin. Um, <coughs> they put cumin in everything. You know, everything. Um, instead of those tiny little spaghetti noodles, you can just put regular, like, noodle pasta. Actually, that's what they do, to do more, actually. The beaches that you show, is that along the Nile? It's not. This is the Red Sea. That's the Red Sea. Beaches. Yeah. Okay. And the Red Sea is clear and clean and huge. And um, it's very, very, it's a very common pastime. Everyone in Egypt, they, you know, on the weekends, they, they used to. Now the roads are getting really bad. Um, people, there's a lot more hijackings because of everything going on. So it's not very safe for a lot of people to drive to the beach anymore. Um, but we did it actually in December. We just risked it and we got, we got there fine. Yeah. Um, so it just depends on the people doing it. Does the story, the, the Rosetta Stone story, does that come out of Egypt? Gosh, I don't know. Have you heard this story? No, I'm not familiar. Is that a, the, about the Rosetta Stone? Oh, it's yeah. like the key to, key to all languages because the, right. the oh, Arabic language is like the hardest one to crack. Oh, that's true. But then somebody found this stone and I, the original word is an Arabic word, but somehow in English it becomes Rosetta. Mm -hmm. But um, I have to look it up in the UK. I saw Jamia and then Jessica, Mrs. Brown. Sorry. Okay. I was just thinking that might be a good in terms of folk tales and stories of okay. things okay. that come out. Mm -hmm. Jamia, um, do Egyptians consider themselves to be African? No. No. Well, Egyptians wouldn't consider themselves to be African, but they also wouldn't consider themselves to be Middle Eastern. They consider it, they're very patriotic. If you ever, if you meet someone from Dubai or Saudi Arabia, to where you're from, they'll probably say, I'm from the Middle East, and I'm in from the Maghreb, the whole thing. But Egyptians will always say, I'm Egyptian. Um, and I would assume that part of that is because of the sort of the racial tensions that still come out of it. Oh, the pound. And that comes from so the British. Mm -hmm. And right now it is eight pounds to a dollar. And in Egypt, eight pounds, when I graduated from high school in 2006, eight pounds got you like a 15, 20 minute cab ride, 20 minute cab, 15 minute cab ride. It got you probably lunch and half of breakfast. Um, now it will get you nothing. The same cab, ride, cab rides that cost eight, do, eight pounds, you know, um, a few years ago, now they'll cost maybe 30. And, and the cents are piastres. And like a couple of piastres, everything's in notes. There's no coins or anything. A couple of piastres used to get you bread and, you know, now it really doesn't anymore, unfortunately. Gas is getting expensive. The lines outside the gas station. Um, I can I can probably bring in some money too, because it's you know it's not worth it. Okay. <laughs> so if I can find some, I can bring, I'll get in touch with you about maybe bringing some things for you. Oh, sorry. Did you have questions? Yes. This is Brown. And the children, the Lauren. How do they have fun? Oh, that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all this going on. 
It's really hard. Um, we're certainly not in a place like Gaza, you know, where kids, there's, you know, where all they have is to throw rocks, but kids in the middle to lower class, they have fun by making their own games together. Um, they probably don't go to school, so they are probably learning their mom's trade, which is probably a housekeeper or, uh, you know, working in a salon for nails or something. Um, kids like to, you know, they're in, really independent. They're these like street kids that they grew up there and it's their like jungle or something. Um, what did you, what games did you play growing up? I, um, do you remember? We didn't, I mean my mom sang me a little song every night before bed, but I actually grew up, when I was you know, I didn't move back to Cairo until the sixth grade. Before that, I was living in Southern Africa, and so it was sort of different. I, I lost that part of the, of the Egyptian culture for that time in my life. Had I been that young growing up there, I'm sure it might have been different. Um, kids like to go. There's bowling alleys for people who can afford it. There's the bowling alleys, movie theaters. Um, there's an amusement park. So for the kids who can afford it, there's plenty to do. Unfortunately, you know, right now, um, that's, it's that pool of children who can, whose parents can afford it is getting smaller and smaller. Um, kids are actually, they're really involved in the revolution right now. There's lots of them out on the streets with their parents, and they're very aware of what's going on, which is important. Valore, did you? It was a question like that, what, you know, what do children do? Um, uh, do you happen to have any um, other artists? I know you mentioned the one artist with uh, other artists or other like st Egyptian storytellers or, or, or some other references like that. I will um, folk tales include it and I have folk tales right okay. here. I, I taught high school for one year, but I know nothing about like what what all what younger children need. I'm not very good at that. Stuff, but I'm glad you're telling me so that I can add it all and I'd be happy to add it all. So Maria. I just um, lost it. What are some of the values taught by the parents to the children growing up? Family is really important because um, it's all you have, and families are really big there. So it's that's important. Um, Egyptians are taught to be to love their country and to work hard, you know, and that if you work hard, you will you will go places. Um, that's what everyone's always been told there. Uh, you know, regardless of class, that's just something you have to work hard. And um, I think that might be one of the biggest problems right now because their whole lives, for generations, we have been told that if you work hard, you will succeed, and no one's succeeding because <laughs> there's too much corruption and um, too much of a brain drain. A lot of people are leaving Egypt. The people who are able to leave Egypt with all this great knowledge, they leave and they don't come back, mm -hmm. which is really too bad. Um, but f family is a really important, to be friends with your family, to love your family, to take care of your family. Um, you know, when your parents get older, there's no nursing homes. We don't have anything like that. They stay with you. Um, you know, my, my mother will live with me forever, <laughs> which is going to be fine. Um, <laughs> but, like, my dad is from Chicago and his mom is in a nursing home and that's just like something my mom doesn't understand and um, so that's it's just to take care of your family. It's a really big one. And your cousins are your friends, your siblings are your friends. You have, end up with a, you know, most families have a lot of siblings and they're, I, mean, I think that's really the biggest one. I had a question about music. I know you spoke about music as very, like the modern music is very westernized, like it has a lot of western influence, but what about traditional music? Like would we do YouTube searches to find that or? Yeah, I can give you a name. Okay. It's something that I can, I made a note of. Um, one name is Um Kel Thum, and it's O-M-K-A-L-T-H-O-U-M. I can, um, I'll put this into something okay. and like and send it to you right away. Mm -hmm. She is like the mother of music of Egypt. She's mm -hmm. just this like really revered woman who, her music is great. They play this little, uh, it's not a mandolin, but it's like a, I'll have to look that up. And it's, very, it's you can't really understand it, it's very like, ah, 
you know, and like mm -hmm. it's something that to my ear I don't understand as much, but like when it comes on the radio, my mother and her her mother, they sort of like they really are like listening to it and they're feeling it and so I think that's a part of the reason it died because Egyptians we don't have to read calligraphy anymore, that's not taught anymore. Um, so I think that's probably part of the reason that that we could, we can't understand it, we can't really appreciate it as much. Um, but that it would you could find her easily on YouTube, yeah. And I can think of that. Jess, oh, Jess put in something, I'm sorry. Is there any um, major either export or imports we need to be aware of? Be it produce or something, I mean I know the oil too. Or Actually, Egypt is the way it is because we don't have much oil. Uh, we're not like Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia or some of the or Dubai with all this. We don't have that kind of money. It is nothing like that. Um, cotton and tea are big ones. You know, you see Egyptian cotton. Right. Um, but in Egypt, you can't find Egyptian cotton anywhere. You know, you really have to go out of your way to find it. So it's a major. We get everything from you know all our stuff is like from China. And, well, you know, I guess pretty recently they're starting to invest in their own resources, but so far it's common. Did you say that most of the kids are not in school? No, um, but there's, you know, Egypt is a, is a service-based country. There are, the, the, the lower classes is so big, so they take a lot of jobs that you would never hear. Like the pharmacy delivers, there's all, you know, McDonald's delivers, and they deliver one thing of small french fries. Of, and there's lots of, um, you know, everyone has a housekeeper. Everyone has a driver. So it's this class, this service class, and depending on what you are within that, in that class, um, your kids will follow suit. So um, it depends on, on your employer. I don't know, um, but kids who, who grow up with their parents as Boeb. A Boeb is the doorman of your building, and he is like the lifeline of your apartment building. He takes care of everything. So these kids, you know, maybe they go to school or maybe they just hang around the building all day. Um, I mean, p parents are trying so hard to keep their kids in school, but the public school system is so bad, and it's, you know, the classes are too full. So there's, you know, a million students cramped into one tiny classroom. And the teachers are not getting paid enough. They are walking out on a daily basis, like I'm going to go smoke ten cigarettes and get coffee because this is so you know bad. You know, and this is the mentality. Teachers feel like I'm not. I don't have to stand here. I'm not going to deal with these kids because this is not my problem. This is our country's problem. And so it's it's really a huge issue. And and then so these kids, the ones who can get to college, you know, are then finding themselves out of luck. The school kids are going to school. I didn't need to say that. That, that no, no kids were going to school, of course. It's just, it's tough, and education is so bad, they would be better off learning what their, their parents trade and making money mm -hmm. so that they can provide for their families. And that's a big thing, you know, as soon as the sibling is like 12 or 13, she's going to work in a house as a housekeeper, so. I mean, it sounds like it was here in the you know, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Exactly, totally, that's exactly what it's like. and. Mm -hmm. It, you know, some employers are very good to their um, to the people in their household, mm -hmm. and those employers will pay for you know, um, your parents are paying for our house, our our maids cleaning service and stuff like this. And, but that's just it. Really, it totally depends. Rich Egyptians tend to be very good to their employers too, which is good. I mean, it's considered your duty. If you have money, you have to employ people because it wouldn't. It's not. Like it wouldn't be fair, which is the comp which is different here, you know. And, and so I, so I know it sounds very cr crazy like that, but that's just that's the mentality there. If you can afford it, you must be employing people in your house because it is a part of the economy. Is that why you went to South Africa for school? My dad works for USAID, so we moved around a lot, like wherever there were projects. So I was. They were living in Zambia when my mom got pregnant, and she wanted to have me in Egypt because that's where she, you know she's from. They met there. That was his first post overseas, and um, so I went there, and then we went back. Um, South Africa and Southern Africa. So I lived in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. It's the same mentality. If you have the money, you should be employing these people because the money that you can pay them to work in your household is still exponentially more than they'll make outside, like at a restaurant. Or, so. Is there a 
on this. There's welfare. There's things. There's ways to be taken care of, but no. there's no like government subsidy, no, or grant or anything. No. Um, there are NGOs. There's things like USA. There are these. There are attempts to to help. So like one big thing with USA, they really wanted to get into birth control and because these women were just having all these babies and then they're literally like, okay, see you later, two year old because I can't afford it. You know, they have so that there's all these homeless children and so obviously one big thing that USA tried to do was implement family planning. But of course because it's a Muslim government that is not allowed. But what else is not allowed is to be a woman and to have a child not married. You know, that's also haram. And it, like there's all these things that are haram, like against the Quran and so like no woman with a, a baby would be, which she would be immediately turned away in any government facility she went to because she should know better. It's her problem. <laughs> you know, it, it's still a very sadly a mentality like that. So there's no, not a lot of sympathy for that kind of thing. So this is what we're gonna do at this time. And um, we're gonna conclude. And if you have any additional questions, you can ask Lisa off record, um, off the recorder. So thank you for coming this afternoon.